um, as cell biologists here, um, our deep commitment for trying to understand how cells are organized. And that's my, the topic of my talk today, which is organelle structure and dynamics. And what I'm going to be focusing primarily on is not what cells are doing per se, but how we as scientists can bring to bear better tools, like what we've heard with uh, Marty, uh, with the GFP, for understanding how cells, cells are organized. Ulti I mean, basically, cells are the fundamental unit of all life as we know it on Earth. Eukaryotic cells, in particular, um, are incredibly complicated. Um, I'll just show this next slide to just give you a, a, a insight into the ultrastructure of a fibroblast. Um, what you can see is it's packed full of subcellular membrane-bound organelles, as well as non-membranous organelles that are scattered all over the cytoplasm. Now, tools are extremely important for us to be able to get insights into how this system is operating. Um, although this is a fibroblast cell, all of its components are shared with all other eukaryotic cells on Earth. But the way that these organelles are arranged relative to each other can be very, very different. And so it's really important for us to have tools for trying to understand these differences, uh, not only localization patterns, but also dynamics. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to focus in on these tools that are helping us get deeper insights into the structure of eukaryotic cells. Now, what is it that we want to know if we look at these cells? We know a, a, a lot. I mean, this image was taken by a technician at NIH in my lab, in the lab that I was working in at, in 1989. And so at that time, we already knew the basic layout of cells in terms of the different organelles, mitochondria, endoplasmic reticulum, endosomes, lysosomes, nucleus, um, peroxisomes. But what we still are wrestling with is trying to understand how these organelles are arranged uh, dynamically as well as in three dimensions. Now, this is a single slice of 90 nanometers through the cell. Um, unless you um, are able to construct the full view of the cell, you will not have any idea as to how these individual organelles are related to each other three-dimensionally. And so I want to start the talk with approaches that we and others are now taking to try to get a better perspective on the 3D organization um, of the shapes of organelles and protein distributions on these organelles. So we've had um, classic transmission EM for many, many years. The big drawback with the transmission EM is it's very hard to get thinner slices than about 70 or 90 nanometers. Um, and you can't reconstruct through the whole cell very easily, although tomographic approaches are, are very, very um, promising. What we've been um, working on uh, together with Harold Hess is to try to see if we can reconstruct cells uh, viewing them with electron, with electron microscope using focused ion beam scanning. And the idea is to, to use scanning electron microscopy to view a slice of a cell um, that's going to be about four nano nanometers in depth, uh, the penetration of the, electron, of the scanning electron microscope, and then you will slice off that four nanometers, and then you'll take another SEM view slice it off using a focused ion beam, and you continue to do that until you go through the entire cell. Now, we haven't gone through a whole cell yet, and that's one of the things that we're uh, intent on doing, but that's going to take quite a while, especially if we want to try to reconstruct all of those organelles. But we've made some attempts, and here's an example of just a small section of the periphery of a fibroblast where we're segmenting out in green the areas occupied by the endoplasmic reticulum. And what you will see is that as we stitch together each of those slices, we can reconstruct 
the three-dimensional organization of the endoplasmic reticulum in this part, this small area of the cell. And basically what you're looking at here is a confocal slice. So at the bottom in, in uh, white, you're seeing the profile of the ER that you would observe if you were using a confocal microscope. What you're seeing in green is the reality, at least as seen with an electron microscope. And what you can see is that there's a huge uh, divergence, if you will. The reality shows a very complex interconnected tubular system that has three dimensionality. This was surprising to me because I thought that the ER, based on our confocal imaging, in the periphery of cells was relatively flat and linear. And in fact, what we're seeing is it's a highly three-dimensional structure out in that periphery. Now, that was just looking at the ER. Can we look at other organelles? And here we have a four nanometer by four, uh, a one by one by two micron uh, volume that um, we're going to be uh, fib simming. And each of the organelles uh, that we're going to be segmenting are outlined in the color code. So plasma membrane is blue. Mitochondria is green, ER is red, endosome is pink. And again, we, we're slicing at uh, four nanometers to be able to get very accurate three-dimensionality uh, organization uh, of all of these organelles. So um, I just wanted to show you what each image looks like. And then as we stitch them together and segment image by image, we can reconstruct how these organelles are arranged uh, in the cell. Now, one of the things I want to draw your attention to here is the, uh, the close communication between the ER in red and the mitochondria. I'll talk more about that. Uh, we think that's really, really important for a lot of activities that are going on in the cell. Now, I've just shown you how electron microscopy can give you details in 3D as to how cells are organized, but what about proteins? Where are the proteins localized on these organelles? And this is an area that um, I think Marty Chalfie's, Chalfie's work with GFP <clears throat> has really um, set the stage <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> for uh, um, all of us to be able to begin um, targeting particular proteins tagged with GFP to visualize how molecules are distributed. Now, several years ago, um, my lab developed a photoactivatable form of GFP, which is dark until you hit it with a UV light um, uh, flash. And that then turns, it converts the GFP to a fluorescent form. Now, what that allows you to do is introduce a whole new um, technology that allows you to have super resolution. And it's based on being able to switch on one molecule at a time, if you will, individual GFP molecules, which if you look at the top, the top panel there, will appear in your microscope as a blob, a blurry blob of about 250 nanometers. But because you have, isol you have switched on one molecule uh, by the photoconversion event, um, and you know it's one molecule because um, you've just seen one blurry spot, you can fit that blurry spot um, its point spread function uh, to calculate with very high accuracy the center of the Gaussian blurred spot uh, that the fluorescent protein has given rise to when viewed through the microscope. So what we can do in the technique called photoactivated localization microscopy, and there are other variations of this type of single molecule-based super resolution, in particular STORM, that uses dye-based uh, activatable proteins. In this case, we're using photoactivatable GFPs. What you can do is attach your photoactivatable GFP to a protein of interest, express it, and then collect raw individual images of photo uh, uh, molecules that are being photoconverted. So they are appearing uh, over time. And each molecule in that raw image represents a particular protein that's localized on the surface of, in this case, the lysosome, which is what we're looking at. And then what we can do is fit the point spread function, the centroid of each of those spots in that raw image, to get a very high resolution palm image. 
uh, where we're summing up all of the position probabilities of these blurry spots to, to map out at very high resolutions thousands and thousands of molecules. Now, we were interested in trying to use this technique not just in looking at single slices or a turf plane of a cell, but to see if we can go through an entire cell. And to do that, we employed lattice light sheet microscopy developed by Eric Betzik and colleagues, where you, can, you essentially can use a sheet of light and pass it quickly through a cell. Now, every, every um, position of that sheet, we can photoconvert molecules that's in that sheet and map out the position probabilities of that mole those molecules. And in that way, as we move through the three-dimensional space of the cell, we can sum up all of the molecules of interest throughout the whole cell. Now, I'm going to show you this for not proteins, but lipids in this case. Here is a lattice light sheet uh, paint or palm uh, image where instead of using proteins, which you would in palm, we're using photoconvertible dyes uh, that localize to membranes, lipids. And so what you're looking at here are slices where we've fit the position of all of the lipids in the cell that are binding to membranes in the cell. And I'll just focus in on one plane so that you can see uh, just the exquisite uh, resolution that this gives you. And because we're looking at lipids instead of proteins, uh, we have much higher um, density of labeling. Um, in fact, this experiment took seven days of acquisition in order to get enough lipid molecules to fit all of their positions to fill in the membranes of the cell. But it was worth doing because we now have a really spectacular 3D uh, or, uh, perspective of, of all of these membranes that comprise the cell. Um, now we're at 20 nanometer isotropic resolution, but we've got a 3D perspective of the cell. So now the, the issue is, okay, well, where are the proteins that we might be interested in the cell? And so in the next slide, I'm going to show you where, a, where we've done a, cor a correlation of this map of uh, membranes superimposed on a particular protein of interest that we've labeled. So, sorry, I just zoomed up on one area of this um, uh, image here where we're looking at the endoplasmic reticulum, and you can see these uh, very dense clusters of three-way intersections that are characteristic of the endoplasmic reticulum, um, something that you would never see using a confocal microscope because all of those clustered three-way junctions would be blurred out uh, because of the resolution uh, limitation. But I want to now get to the correlation. So we can correlate uh, the paint image of membranes uh, that we've acquired using lattice light sheet microscopy with fluorescence microscopy uh, using a protein of interest. In this case, we're using an ER marker called SEC61, uh, localizes on the membranes of the ER, and you can see when you bring in the, the uh, white or, or um, yeah, the, the white pattern, the overlap between the distribution of the SEC61 on top of that super resolution image of the uh, membranes of the cell. Now, one of the things that we're trying to do now is use palm or IPOM instead of uh, just diffraction limited imaging of our protein of interest that would be superimposed on these maps of these membranes that we've acquired uh, using this paint labeling approach. So these are just two ways, um, the FIPSIM and the lattice light sheet paint uh, uh, fluorescence micro uh, correlation uh, approach that allows one now to get much better insight into how these organelles are organized in three dimensions. And particularly, I think they have a lot of promise for trying to superimpose uh, the position of proteins of interest that people might have in this system. I now want to move into um, 
how organelles are organized relative to each other. Um, what are the, how these organelles are touching each other, how are they communicating with each other, and how does this play out in a dynamic fashion? Everything that I just showed you up to now was fixed cells. Uh, that's the only way we're going to get at that kind of high resolution. But can we get insight into the temporal dynamics of this system? And is there ways to improve on those temporal dynamics? So approach that we're taking for this in terms of understanding how organelles are arranged relative to each other is to improve on our ability to be able to image floor, many fluorophores simultaneously. Now typically, if you use any confocal microscope, you can at best get three fluorophores uh, distinguished in, your, in any particular experiment. But if you try to do more, um, and in this case, I have six different fluorophores that we would like to be able to image because we can attach each of those fluorophores to proteins of interest that target to different organelles uh, in order to visualize how all of these organelles are behaving at once. The problem is on these microscopes, there's no set of six filters that will discriminate among these different fluorophores because they have overlapping emission spectra. And that's illustrated in this uh, uh, this um, diagram here where you can see that the emission profiles of each one of those fluorophores significantly overlaps. Now if we attach those fluorophores to organelle markers, so we have CFP at the top attached to lysosomes, then we have mitochondria attached to GFP, ER attached to YFP, peroxisomes, Golgi, lipid droplets, those are the six organelles that we would like to be able to look and watch in a dynamic sy system. The problem is, is that if we express each of those organelle tags in a cell and pass through our microscope, look through the emission spectrum, you'll see there's complete overlap of many of these organelles. And that prevents us from being able to see individual organelles separately from each other because of this overlap problem. So to overcome this, two postdocs in my lab, Alex Vom and Sarah Cohen, decided to take advantage of a well-known technology of multispectral uh, unmixing to see if we can take all of those emission spectra that are known and use mathematics to unmix them. So if we have a cell that's expressing all six of those fluorophores and we take an image of any particular pixel, we're going to have an overlap of one or more of those fluorophores. Um, but if we use unmixing algorithms, we can find a best fit of the observed pixel spectrum with a, uh, with a subset of the known fluorophores. And from that, we can know in every pixel of our specimen what set of fluorophores gave rise to the image that we see, the, the image on that pixel. And so that's the strategy that we've been taking to be able to image simultaneously six different organelles over time. And we're going to be doing this with the lattice light sheet microscope, although it's possible to do this on uh, many commercial microscopes. The advantage of the lattice light sheet is its ability to acquire very um, isotropic 3D sectioning through a cell. Um, what we've done in order to enable this on our lattice light sheet is we fed in six different laser lines to activate each one of the fluorophores attached to the six different organelles. Um, you can see as we move through each one of those lasers uh, and we can control them with a, an AOBS, an adaptive optic beam spl uh, uh, splitting device, we can um, uh, very quickly modulate in any particular section um, all uh, the light so that we can turn on all of these different fluorophores and then we pass them through a series of interference uh, uh, filters and do our unmixing uh, to be able to identify all six of these different organelles, which is shown here. So you can see peroxisomes, mitochondria, ER, gold sheet, lysosome, lipid droplets. This is all in one cell, each of these organelles and how they're uh, behaving. Now we can add up, we can superimpose all of these images to create 
a 3D spectral time-lapse image of a cell to show the dynamics of these uh, uh, organelles uh, over time. It was very exciting to see this because, um, you know, you always wonder when you're doing your microscope uh, uh, imaging and you're just looking at one particular organelle, what's happening to all of these other organelles. But with a lattice light sheet, we can get a lot more information. Uh, at the single cell level, we can start interrogating organelle measurement values. For instance, uh, we can see very easily that the ER has the largest volume, occupies the largest volume and surface area in the cell. Um, it's about 30 times that of the Golgi, uh, eight or so times that of the mitochondria. We can count up the number of peroxisomes, the number of lysosomes, the number of lipid droplets in any particular cell. Um, and we can look at how they're moving, what the average movement of these structures are and what, and what direction. We can also segment individual organelles uh, and color code them to be able to find intimate crosstalk between the different organelles. So here, we just, uh, we just color co coded uh, appropriately each of these different organelles and shown areas where these organelles appear to be very much um, associated with each other. In fact, um, we can come in and create maps of what we're calling organelle-organelle contacts because the organelles are occupying the same pixel area for um, several seconds. And that leads us to think that these organelles are actually communicating with each other. Now, exactly what they're doing in terms of that communication, we don't know, but um, we know from the literature that there's lipid that can be transferred from one organelle to another, and there's calcium that can very quickly be transferred uh, from different organelles. From this image, you can see um, that uh, the ER by far has the largest number of contacts with other organelles. It's communicating with all of, uh, all of the organelles within the cell. Um, uh, in particular, the mitochondria, uh, there is very close contact between those structures. And that's illustrated in this movie here, where to the left, we've segmented out all of the mitochondria in a single cell. So you can see the, mito the mitochondria is a highly tubulated, interconnected system. But to the right, what we've done is we've superimposed, um, uh, we've looked at what part of that mitochondria is also occupied by ER. And so in green are, is all of the areas, all of the parts of the mitochondria that at any particular time is communicating with the ER. They have a shared pixel. <clears throat> um, so the ER clearly has very close com uh, communication uh, with mitochondria. Now as I mentioned, the ER occupies the largest surface area of any organelle. In fact, it occupies 25% of the cell volume, um, at least based on our measurements. I mean, for sure, we're going to come in and uh, see to what extent FibSim will give, slightly, will give different values because we have much higher resolution with FibSim. But with our confocal lattice light sheet imaging, uh, when we sum up the, all of the area that the ER is occupying, it's about 25% of the cytoplasm separate the nucleus. Now what was amazing was that if we watched the ER over time, what we find is that within 15 minutes, um, what you're seeing here is a movie where we're just summing up the position of the ER throughout the cytoplasm as a function of time. And what you can see is that within 15 minutes, it has explored 97% of the cytoplasm, meaning that this organelle is not only occupying the, uh, many parts of the cytoplasm, but it's actively exploring it. There are mechanisms that are allowing the ER to continually search out different parts of the cytoplasm. And I'll talk about that uh, in the final part of my talk. So what I've just told you is some new technology, multispectral lattice light sheet, or just multispectral confocal on, on mixing, that can really um, help us understand how many organelles are communicating with each other. And I should emphasize that this multispectral and mixing approach is not limited to just six different organelles. If you can put in more uh, fluorophores 
or use other ways to distinguish these floor fours from each other, you can get up to, you know, up to 20 or more uh, probes simultaneously uh, distinguished within a cell. So in the final part of my talk, I want to now move to even faster dynamics um, to try to understand, uh, are we missing something in the temporal regime? Uh, we're imaging, you know, like one second uh, per, 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 per uh, image. Can we uh, move, can we go faster? And if we go faster, what do we see? Uh, I also want to talk about imaging individual proteins in the last part. Okay, now in this whole section that I'm going to be talking about, we're, I'm going to be focused on the endoplasmic reticulum. This is a cool organelle. There's no question about it. It's involved in not only forming the nuclear envelope, but it controls calcium regulation within the cell. It's where 30% of the genome is directed to form the, to, <coughs> to derive membranes in the cell, as well as drive the secretory pathway, secretory structures. So it's where ribosomes associate for protein translation. Um, and as I mentioned, it's communicating with every other organelle within the cell, presumably for lipid trafficking and calcium regulation. So can we look at it at higher resolution? And so for this, we employed a, a turf structural illumination microscope um, that was developed uh, by, in Eric Betzik's lab uh, by Dong Lee, and we've uh, been using that system. We have that own, uh, we've rebuilt that system in my own lab, and this is what we're using to do all of these experiments. But it's a, the turf aspect of this microscope allows you to zone in, very, image just one part of the cell, so that you can image it very, very fast. And the structural illumination half of this microscope allows you to improve your resolution um, twofold. Okay, so what do we see? So here's the endoplasmic reticulum in the periphery of the cell. And what I want you to focus in on <clears throat> is the tubules. They are very dynamic, and they come together in three-way junctions, tri-junctions, that can move, that can um, <clears throat> come together or pull apart on very rapid time scales. <clears throat> now, one of the things that we were surprised by was the tubules themselves, which we could show undergo a type of oscillatory motion. These are <clears throat> chymographs through different parts of the tubes, and you can see that in any, any, any series of images, and we're collecting at 50 millisecond time frames, you can see that those tubes are oscillating. Now, what's interesting is that this oscillation is not just thermally derived. It's not Brownian motion, if you will, in the cell, because it's ATP and GTP dependent. If we knock out ATP and GTP supplies in cells, we slow down or stop this movement. Now, we think it's this dynamic motion that allows the tubular system itself to rearrange. Um, now, we also know that the ER can move itself on microtubules, and the actin cytoskeleton can push it around. In fact, we think that it's the actin cytoskeleton that potentially is um, driving some of these uh, 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 oscillations, um, because when we treat cells with blevastatin to, to hit motors, my uh, myosin motors, we slow down this motion dramatically, suggesting it's an indirect motion of a churning motion of uh, cytoplasm driven by uh, the actin cytoskeleton. And we also know that the ER tubes can pull out, uh, are pulled out to the periphery of cells by microtubules, kinesin motors. But this kind of dynamic um, sh sort of shifting of clusters of ER tubules uh, from being dispersed to being very concentrated can happen over the course of milliseconds. You would not have seen it with a conventional confocal microscope. And we can come in and we can um, skeletonize the ER in order to look more carefully at those three-way junctions, uh, those intersection points between these different tubes. Um, and I should emphasize um, that the ER is one organelle. All of these tubes connect with each other. Um, we know that from all kinds of studies, FRAP studies in particular. So this is one, it's like a, a net that's being pushed around within the cell. 
And so we can study the, contact, the, the um, connections of this net, if you will. Um, this is just tracking the individual three-way junctions to get uh, the insight into their mean square displacement with time. Interesting point is, again, the system is dependent on ATP and GTP in order to maintain that dynamism. Now, one of the things I want to just bring your attention to is just how you can be fooled uh, by just confocal imaging. Up to, on the uh, right-hand top image is an area of the, uh, a zoomed-in area of the ER that we would have said looked very much like a sheet, a smooth sheet. Um, in fact, when we first were collecting these turf images, I just said, oh, yeah, that's cool. That's a, you know, ER sheet. But when we turned on our structural elimination microscope, what we found is that it was not a sheet at all. It was an elaborate tubular system. Um, in fact, that looks almost fenestrated. But in fact, if you come in with electron microscopy or other types of improved imaging, you see that, um, that this is really just a dense cluster of these three-way junctions, uh, which has led us uh, to the view that really the, perf the peripheral ER is mainly comprised of just tubes and three-way junctions that can either be widely dispersed or highly clustered together into, into three-dimensional shapes. I want to emphasize that we know from EM, uh, in particular from Tom Rappaport's lab, that there are ER sheets that are stacked, that are very much adjacent to the nucleus. But in the periphery of the cell, where most people have thought they've seen sheets, we believe that these structures, in fact, are just dense arrays of highly clustered three-way junctions of these ER tubules. OK, well, can we see things move in this system? And this is where a really an amazing sort of collaboration emerged last summer at Marine Biology Laboratories, the physiology course. All of you students out there, if you want to have an amazing experience, come to this course this summer. Actually, is our is uh, going to be fun. Okay, but anyway, we um, this this happened last summer. Uh, we decided to see if we could actually track molecules in the endoplasmic reticulum, and this is the team that did that. They first just convinced themselves that things move quickly in the ER by performing fluorescence recovery after photobleaching. Here we are expressing a SEC61 uh, uh, fluorescent protein in the ER. That circle is where we bleach. And what you can see is that very quickly after that bleach, within just a few minutes, fluorescence returns. That return of fluorescence is due to these molecules, the bleached molecules diffusing out of that bleached areas and fluorescent molecules moving in. Um, and that is illustrated in that rec recovery curve. Well, can we see these molecules? And so for that, we took a halo tag, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, a RAB18, which is an ER uh, protein, halo tagged it, and then used a photoactivatable probe to see if we could turn on individual molecules at sufficiently low density that we could track them. And that's what you can see right here. So now I want to just go into a little tiny bit more detail in the last two minutes of uh, what we know about, what we've learned up to now about these molecules. Here we're doing 50 second millisecond continuous imaging. We just follow this uh, SEC61 uh, and sum up all of the tracks. You can see it fills, it ex all of these molecules are exploring the entire space of the ER, um, which is cool. So now we can go in and look at the individual tracks. We can determine whether molecules move fast or slow when they come to three-way junctions or move to different parts of the ER, and that's what we're trying to do here. Uh, these tracks that you're seeing are color-coded based on whether they're fast or slow. Red is fast and slow is blue. Here is just, again, another example of this um, where, in this case, all the tracks are green, uh, but I'm just trying to show you just how fast these molecules are moving. This is real time. So the pink is the ER that we're imaging with diffraction limited light, and the green is particles that we're tracking along the surface of that ER. Because we want to know where that ER is, otherwise it's, you know, 
we could be fooled as to what molecule we're, molecules we're looking at. Um, here you see um, how these molecules are moving. This is one third the speed of real time, just so that you can get a better feeling of the trajectories of these molecules. And one last point. So of course, now that we can track molecules in the ER, one question is, do they change? You know, do all of these molecules freely diffuse, or do they change their motion when they're doing something? And so for that, we looked at a molecule that resides in the ER called VAP-B that plays an important role in cross-linking uh, or um, tethering ER to mitochondria and or other organelles. Um, it does this in order to facilitate uh, transfer of lipids between these two organelles when they cl come closely opposed to each other. So we started looking at VAP um, and the way it's moving in the ER, and that's what you're seeing here, all those uh, trajectories. Uh, they're color-coded, fast uh, in red, uh, slow in blue. And we also have um, the ER in the background so that you can see the molecules moving along the surface of the ER, and that's in white. But in red, we have where the mitochondria are also localized. And what I think you can see is that when the tracks move over the, course, over the surface of that mitochondria, they appear uh, bluish, suggesting they're slowing down. And this is just illustrating this again. To the left is VAP-B, uh, where you can see the molecules are clearly slowing down when they hover, when they, when they move across ER that's in the vicinity of the mitochondria. As an, uh, as an alternative, tail anchor, a tail-anchored uh, targeted ER protein doesn't show that at all. And this is just the sum of these tracks. In white is the outline of mitochondria. You can see tail anchor protein does not move uh, in the areas of the ER where that, uh, um, that are close opposed to the mitochondria, whereas the VAP-B is just all over the area of the ER that's in closely opposed to the mitochondria. So with that, I want to end and thank you for your attention. Uh, these are the people that have been really critical to this work. I mentioned at the beginning, um, Alex Vaughn and Sarah Cohen did the multispectral unmixing work. Aubrey Weigel, Chris Obera, and uh, uh, Johnny Nixon Abel did uh, all of the ER work. And the single molecule stuff was in collaboration with our students at Woods Hole. I also want to thank some key people at Genelia, um, Eric Betzik, uh, Harold Hess, Eric with the live cell work, uh, imaging work that we've done, many of the microscopes really um, were, uh, it was his invention of some of these microscopes that was key for that, and Harold with a fib sim. But I want to make a final pitch, pitch for, for those of you in the audience uh, who may be saying, well, that's cool, but, you know, we don't have those microscopes. Well, recognizing that um, the HHMI and uh, the, uh, the uh, Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation has put together a, an advanced imaging facility at Genelia which is where I work, um, up there. And this uh, center as essentially welcomes applications by people like you. Um, if the application is accepted, um, we will essentially take care of you at Genelia for whatever time it takes uh, with um, key people who will be running those microscopes to help you do those experiments. Um, every six months, there's a call for new applications. Um, Genelia completely houses you, feeds you, and helps you run your microscopes. The only thing you have to do is get a ticket to get to Genelia. So it's an incredible deal. Um, so I recommend any of you in the audience, if any of the work that I've been talking about um, is exciting from the perspective of what you're doing, please think about applying uh, to this center. And I'll see you there then. But anyway, thank you.